Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you as you give the word. Before we get into today's message, I want to warn you in advance that some of the content in this series may be offensive at times, but that's okay because growth at times requires growth pains. Prolonged immaturity is arguably the most underestimated enemy of God-given destiny. It's time to mature. So get ready for mature audiences only. I'm so excited about today. I'm excited about this series. I'm excited about this. To me, in my, in my opinion, the series that I am currently preaching is the most vital series I've ever preached in my entire life. And that's in 26, 7 years of, 28, 9 years of ministry. Uh, <laughs> I saw my A's going up. So the numbers. <laughs> I used to say 20 years of ministry, and that was a long time ago. <laughs> But to me, it is the most powerful series that I've ever preached because I believe it to be true because it is maturing the believer in such a way. If you listen to each one of these messages one by one, when you get to the end and you follow the prescription prescribed in the, in the services, in, in the message, I promise you this, at the end of nine short weeks, you will be more mature than 90% of the body of Christ. That's how powerful these sermon series are. So we've been unpacking this, and this is a nine-week series and I'm very, very excited about it because we're committed here to growing in grace. Amen. How many of you know we're committed to growing in grace? I am committed for Andrew to grow. I don't know about y'all. I want to know who I am. Come on, somebody. Uh, how many of you know that we start out as babes in Christ, as new creations in Jesus, but we don't have to stay babes in Christ. Amen. We can choose to mature and to grow in our faith, a faith that is by faith and not of works. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and men. So if Jesus himself matured, then I believe it's safe to say that we should be prepared to mature as well so that we can be uh, everything that God's called us to be in every area of our life. The scripture repeatedly cautions us against the dangers of remaining immature. Prolonged immaturity is arguably the most underestimated enemy of anybody's God-given destiny. Do you all hear that? It, it undermines your progress. It hinders your relationship. It prevents you from realizing your God-given potential. Remember, I've said it every week, you need to hear this. The level of your impact will rarely rise above the level of your maturity. Think about what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things away. I know I've said this every week, but it's, it deserves repeating every week. I think I'd say it every week of my ministry if it didn't get redundant. But immaturity is like taking candy from a baby. It's meant to describe how easy it is to accomplish something or take advantage of someone because of their lack of awareness or the lack of maturity. It, it, and this illustrates uh, too well the dangers of remaining immature because when a adult grows older chronologically but doesn't mature spiritually, they become so gullible in the spirit that it's like taking candy from the baby. The enemy just comes along and just, and you fall down. Why? Because you become too vulnerable. You're easily deceived, easily offended, and become easily distracted. Now, so far in this series, we've talked about maturing in our message, in our minds. Last week, we talked about maturing in our, in our mouth. And we're going to continue talking about maturing in our motives, in our marriage, in our relationships, in our money, in our media. But today, we're going to talk about what it means to mature in our ministry. We're going to look at some very practical things that we're called to grow into. We're going to look at how we're called to serve others. Let me say that again, how we're called to serve others. And this is the key for us maturing in our ministry. Go to your Bibles and look at me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to begin reading at verse 10. Here's what the Bible says. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
if what we know to be true is, all, is, is, is really is the truth, if Jesus died our death and now we, so that we could live his life, we must know what the Christ life is. Amen? Jesus gave us clarity on what his life uh, was about several times in his teaching, but maybe none more to the point than his statement that he made in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The Bible says, The Son of Man did not come to serve, but rather to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We know the way Jesus died changed the world, but did you know that the way he lived changed an entire culture? He changed the world by his sacrifice, but he changed the culture by his serving. They'd never seen anybody walk around in authority and yet be committed to serving humanity. It blew people's minds. Jesus was all about serving others. He dedicated his ministry and ultimately his life to the mandate of serving everybody around him. Jesus is certainly centered, uh, certainly considered, if not the greatest leader the world's ever known. But what made him so great wasn't his willingness to lead others, but rather his willingness to serve others. If I got any help in here, I'd preach all this today. Our culture always focuses on the different aspects of leadership to attempt to define what a great leadership is. You know, Jesus, uh, Jesus defined it in a different way, but our culture defines it. It's all about your age. It's all about your appearance. It's all about your accomplishment. It's all about the academics. When it came to Jesus, he didn't define leadership with any type of those factors. He determined it by serving others. So let's look at what makes uh, what it looks like for a mature for our ministry uh, to be deter, m- mature and serve others. Think back again on Ephesians chapter two verse ten that I said. Look how that verse begins. It says, "We are God's handiwork." The key in, mat- in making sure that we don't find our value in what we do is to make sure that our identity is secure. If you don't know who you are, what you do will not have any effect on your life. Too many believers find their value in what they do rather than who they are. It's a trap. It's a trap that religion sets in order to put us back in the path of performance mode. Performance Christianity. i got to perform for Jesus to love me. Let's break this thing down. If you write this down, you can also find these on the Calvary app. And I encourage you to go on the Calvary app and, uh, and look up all these notes because you can go back to them, refer back to them uh, if you need to. Uh, number one, I want you to write this down. We don't serve for identity. We serve from identity. If you're serving in order to become somebody, then you're operating under the prescription that you started out as a nobody. How many of you know, we didn't start out as a nobody. Jesus said before the foundation of the world was made, he created you and knew your name. So you started out with value. The cross didn't make you value. The cross showed you how valuable you already are, somebody. In the kingdom, we don't serve in order to figure out who we are. Jesus sets the precedence for this in his own ministry. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus went down to the Jordan and had his cousin, John the Baptist, baptize him there. We find the story in Matthew chapter six, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. It says this, And then when he had been baptized, and I love this, Jesus came immediately out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and, 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 and lighting upon him. And suddenly a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, of course, God was pleased with Jesus. After all, He healed the sick. He fed the multitudes. He walked on water. He raised the dead. Man, how could God not love him? No wonder he was pleased. Can I help you with something, though? At this time in Jesus' ministry, he hadn't done a thing. Nobody's been raised. Nobody's been healed. The only thing we know of Jesus is he liked to sit around and listen to teachers and ask tough questions. But up until that moment in time, he never did diddly. Think about this. You need to get this. He was pleased with Jesus because Jesus was his son. It was then Jesus went on to do great works. So Jesus didn't serve in order to become a well-pleasing son. He served because he already knew he was a well-pleasing son, and it works the same way with us. We don't please, we don't, we don't, God's not pleased with us because of what we do. He's pleased with us because we are his son. Once you've been born again, we're his sons. 
then we can serve from identity, not for our identity. Y'all see this? If you're serving God in order to get Him to be pleased with you, you're operating like an orphan. But when you start realizing that you're already pleasing the God, then you serve like a son. There's two things that a father does. A father uh, 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 releases identity and affirmation. Think about this. My beloved son, his identity, in whom I'm well pleased, affirmation. So don't miss this. When your ministry begins with my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased, then it will end with, well done, my good and faithful servant. Every single time. Remember back in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, look what he said. We are God's handiwork. We are a good work that's been created to do good work. Did you hear that? We are a good work. The Bible says we are God's handiwork. So I'm God's work, and I was created to do good work. Think about this. I'm not my own handiwork. So, so our performance flows from who we are. It isn't designed to determine who, who we are. Think about this. Don't forget that, church. We are not what we do. We do what we are. Let me say that again. We are not what we do, but we do what we are. Which leads me to the second thing I want to talk to you about is this. Number two, and write this down. Not only have a position, we not only have a position in Christ, but we have a purpose in Christ. One of the traps that the New Covenant believers sometimes fall in is just because Jesus' work is finished, it doesn't mean ours is. I'm going to stop here and pause. Take a sip of water for effect. Was it effective? I thought it would be. I thought it would be. Because I want to say that again. One of the traps that New Covenant believers sometimes fall to is that just because Jesus' work is finished does not mean ours is. The truth is that God loves us so much that it gives us a purpose in order to now work in and through us. We didn't understand that we don't just need to be, we wasn't just saved from something, but how many of y'all know we were saved for something? You wasn't saved just from something, but you were saved for something. How many of you know you were brought out so that he could bring you in? You were brought out of darkness so he could bring you into his light. You've been purchased and purposed. God has purpose for your life, and I say that with all confidence because of the fact that you're still here proves it. It's been said the two most important days in your life is is the day that you're born and the day you find out why. Purpose is a powerful thing. God designed it that way. So he places inside each of us a desire to see what what uh, to see a purpose come to pass in our lives. That that feeling is known as fulfillment. Y'all know when you accomplish something and you walk out of it, I love to see graduates when they, when they graduate high school and they walk across the stage, they look so fulfilled. They, they've just accomplished everything. They've accomplished this 12 years of not, even, not knowing. They just, it's just getting started good. <laughs> but in that moment, they accomplished, right? They feel fulfilled. Amen? Y'all maybe y'all remember walking across the stage and getting your high school diploma. I don't, but okay. Realizing your identity gives us a sense of security. If I know who I am, realizing your purpose gives us the same in the same way gives us a sense of fulfillment. You need to get this. It's possible to be loved, cared for, provided for, and affirmed in who we are in Christ. But but the only way to get a sense of true fulfillment is to walk in God's purpose for our life. You're never going to know what it's like to truly be fulfilled until you walk in God's purpose for your life. Can I tell you something right now? When I stand up here and I hold the microphone in my hand, this, this to me, the most precious instrument that I have, I hold this microphone and I preach the Word of God that no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm dealing with, no matter what I walk in the door with or what I walk out when I walk out the door, while I'm in my purpose, everything in my life is perfect. Everything in my life right now at this moment is perfect. Why? Because I'm standing in my purpose. He loves you no matter what, and He's satisfied with you in Christ alone. But walking in purpose does satisfy you when it comes to you being fulfilled. Think about the key text. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So if you're going to mature in our ministry, it's a key that we learn to serve others 
with our good works. Not, not to get blessed. I don't, I'm not doing it to get blessed. I'm doing it because I am blessed. And once you realize you're blessed, you want to be a blessing. Now, our final point when it comes to maturing in our ministry is found in the last portion of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We were creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Look at that last verse, that sentence, which God prepared in advance to do. That's so important. The works we are to, were to do have been provided by God in advance. Watch this. He loves you so much, His purpose is laid for you. You ain't even got to figure it out. All you got to do is walk in it. How cool is God in all this? Amen? This is what it means when we refer to our calling. It's what God has called us to do. Okay? Now I want you to write down this last truth. I'm going to slow my roll right here if I can. We don't serve to fulfill our potential. We serve to fulfill God's plan. Let me say that again. We don't serve to fulfill our potential. We serve to fulfill God's plan. Let me explain why this is such a huge deal. We live in a culture today that's constantly pushing us to reach our potential. Don't we do that to our kids? We push to reach your potential, reach your potential, reach your potential. Now, I understand that most of the time that's a noble thought. After all, shouldn't we strive to be our best, strive to do our best? But as leaders, sometimes we observe someone and say, think about this, if you only knew your potential. How many have ever been told that? If you only knew your Ma'am, I'll tell you what, I got told that so many stinking times in my life. Boy, I'll tell you what, if you only knew your potential. If I only knew it, I wouldn't be here. Okay, now, that was then, this is now. Think about this. Potential deals with the realization of what we can do. And the world's culture is riddled with the idea of doing everything you can do. Reach your maximum potential. But I want to pose a thought to you that's just wrecked me. Are y'all ready for this? Jesus didn't fulfill his potential. Let that soak in a little bit. Jesus did not fulfill his potential. Y'all ready to hear me now? Pastor, how can you say that? Because number one, Jesus was God and God can do anything, right? But Jesus was more focused on fulfilling his purpose and not his potential. He wasn't focused on doing what he could do. He was focused on doing what he was called to do. Just think about this. Look in the Garden of Gethsemane. They come to, 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 to arrest Jesus, and Peter gets mad and hacks off Caiaphas' ear and then listen to Jesus' response in Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think I could pray to my Father, and he would provide for me more than twelve legion of angels? How then could the Scripture be fulfilled that it must happen thus. Did you see it? Did you see it? Jesus had the potential to call on 12 legions of angels. In other words, Jesus had the potential in that moment to say, 12,000 angels to my side now. And they would have showed up and said, what you want us to do? They'd come up in a thug life. Angels thug life. <laughs> Is that not good? <laughs> no. My bad. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. My bad. Innocent here. Innocent old person. <laughs> <laughs> but think about that. He could have called down 12,000 angels. But notice what he said. He said, I'm not, I couldn't do this because if I did, the scriptures would not be fulfilled. So Jesus was more focused on his purpose that he was his potential. You need to get this. When he was on the cross, the thief on the cross says, show us your potential. Take us and yourself off this cross. Come on now. And here's on just a little on a side note. It's amazing how other people want you to fulfill your potential when it helps them. I'm just going to leave that there. But even though Jesus could do it, he didn't. Why? Because that wasn't his purpose. With that in mind, stop focusing on what you can do and start focusing on what you're 
called to do. It's about his purpose and not your potential. I remember the night I got called to preach. I was in the altars. The service was over. It was on a Sunday night. And I'm in the altars. Nobody left there but the pastor and my wife and two kids. They were just sitting waiting on me. We'd been there, we'd been there a minute. And, uh, but the Lord spoke to me that night oh, and, and called me to preach. And when he did, he gave me a choice. He said, I, I heard the Holy Spirit. He said, at the time, I was operating a couple of companies, and they were doing very well. I was starting to, to, to my business was starting to take off. I was really about to hit the big numbers. I was about to expand, really excited about what God was doing in my life. I was about to do that. And the Holy Spirit said, if you continue doing what you're doing, I'll cause you to finance my kingdom. But if you'll preach my gospel, I'll give you peace. Watch this. In that moment, I had the potential to choose wealth. Because there's no doubt in my mind, with, with not bragging anything, but with my skills and my work ethic, I would have got wealthy. You, you take good skills and good work ethic together, and I don't give up, I don't stop, and I don't quit. And so, so that I would have gotten very wealthy, but that wasn't my purpose. I, I still believe being very wealthy is my purpose. I haven't figured out how to get there yet. <laughs> but I know that preaching the gospel is my purpose. Now, just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. In Philippians 4.13 even tells us that we can do all things through Christ which gives us strength. Don't mean we're supposed to. But hear me, church, just because you can do it doesn't mean you're supposed to. It's important, even imperative, that we do what we're called to do. If we spend all our time, talent, money, energy on doing things we can, then we almost guarantee to do nothing better than burn out. Why? Because we aren't serving God from a place of grace. Servanthood from a gospel perspective is this. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you serve from a place of grace, you will find yourself remaining in the rest of God. And when you, that happens, the job will be done in excellence. You will remain rested, and God will receive all the glory for it. We as believers don't have to try to do every good work. Instead, we focus on the work that God has prepared us to do in advance. So at Calvary Church, it's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to mature in our ministry. It's time for us to rise uh, uh, up as sons and daughters of God and truly operate as the hands and feet of Jesus here on the earth. We do this by serving. Serving God by serving others. That's what Jesus did, and that's what we're called to do. And if you want to move, if we, if we want to move from just being babes in Christ, so I want you to imagine this. How many of us, if we saw our spiritual life, this is what we would look like? We walk around with bibs on, aprons. What's it? And how many know? Here's the aprons on, bibs on. How many of you know babies are cute? You see them sitting in a crib, you walk up to them. And isn't it amazing when a baby's laying in that thing, you walk up to them, make weird faces at them? It's funny to watch people and go and make baby faces, and weird baby. They spit up, and they cried at, at, at the most unopportune times. Come on. They whine when they don't get their way. They always want everybody else to feed them, serve them, give them, bless them, take care of me, clothe me, bathe me, help me, walk me, wipe me, do <laughs> feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, burp me. What? That's what babies do. How many of you, what would you look like if your spirit life was unveiled and your maturity level was unveiled? But I believe that God's called us. To something much more elegant.
Don't be dissing on the apron. You say, Pastor, I ain't wearing that. I ain't either in a minute. But here's what I want you to know is this. This is the body of what the body of Christ should be wearing. We should be wearing aprons, towels over our arms, saying, how can we serve you? How heartbreaking is it is to get the good news in your spirit, in your heart, in your life? How heartbreaking it is. I, I'm laughing at myself. I got to take this off. <laughs> But how heartbreaking is it that we've received all this good news? Your life has been radically changed. And listen to me, folks watching online too, thank you guys so much for tuning in, but I want you to hear what I'm about to say. God did not call us to receive grace, to walk guilt-free living, and go to house. God called us to receive His goodness and His grace to be rid of guilt and condemnation, to have peace and joy, real freedom. Oh, let's just keep that to ourselves. How dare us? If we have good news, I love, Jessica gave me a phone call a while back. Pastor, pastor, you won't believe this. We're having a baby. Man, I was dope, man. I was like, yeah. Oh, I was all excited. Get a call from Michaela. Pastor, you won't believe this. We having two babies. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Yeah. They was excited to tell me good news. We have good news. We're consumed. We're ed up with it. I am at slap up with good news. If I'm at up with good news, then what does that mean? I need to share somebody. My gosh, we'll, we'll, we do a better job sharing, sharing our best recipes than we do sharing Jesus. So we need to be sharing the good news that we have. Not because we have to, but because why? Y'all say that louder. Why? You don't have to. You get You get to allow other people to experience the radical joy, the radical peace, the radical guilt-free living, the radical love, the radical grace that consumes your life. You get all that, and now I get the amazing opportunity to tell you how loved you are, how cherished you are, how amazing God sees you. You're a son. You're a daughter. You're loved. You're beloved. You're cherished. God's for you, not against you. Your best days are ahead of you. The love of Jesus consumes you. God's grace overtakes you. The abundant life is yours. The pure life is yours. The holy life is yours. You are righteous. You are holy. You are set apart. And the faster you believe that about yourself, the faster you're going to be able to go tell somebody about the amazing, cherished grace that you have now found. We don't serve because we have to. We serve because we get to. And every person in this room right now, every person in the room has a capacity in which they can serve. Don't care who you are. I actually don't understand I'm an introvert. Don't care. It's something that God's called you to do. As a matter of fact, God will use that to His benefit. You don't understand, Pastor. I, I, don't, I, I can't talk to people. I, I stutter when I talk. It's okay. Read Moses. Man couldn't talk for spit. Let a whole nation out of, out of bondage. You are important. Your service, the body of Christ, is vital for us to see the potential that God's called us to have. Because I know, I believe in the message. I believe in the power of this good gospel. And I believe in the way it's preached like it's never been preached before. And I believe that God's given us the message. With everything I've got, I have hope, joy, and peace. I'm full of love and grace and mercy. I, don't, I, I struggle trying to make my 
I still judge somebody. I live in this amazing place. And I can't help but tell everybody else about this amazing place that I live in. And when you get there, you want everybody else with you. I want everybody in the room with me. When that happens, you open yourselves up and say, Jesus, you have good works prepared in advance for me. I think I'll walk in them. I think I'll walk in them. Would y'all stand up with me all over the house? How many would say it's good to be in the house of the Lord? So I'm going to leave you with a challenge. I challenge you this. I challenge you to grow in, the, in, in, in our serving of others. A challenge to begin to be aware of the needs around us so that Jesus can work in and through us. A challenge to truly mature in our ministry by expressing the love of God through our encounters with others. That's the power and the authority that I believe that we profess that God's going to use us in a great way. Pastor, how does it begin? It begins simply by this. Learning the, the key to it is this. Doing what's in front of you to do. Be in the moment and watch God use you in ways you never dreamed possible. If you see a need, fulfill it. Watch as God opens up doors in front of you as you walk into it. Amen. Father, I thank you today for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for these servants. God, I thank you, God, not for these servants. I'm sorry, God, I thank you for these sons. These sons, God, who love to serve. These sons, God, who love to be there for their people, who love to minister to their friends, their neighbors, their loved ones. God, I ask you right now, God, the beauty of these amazing people that you've given me the ultimate privilege of pastoring. God, may their beauty shine. May their love for Jesus and their love for others shine. More importantly, may the love of Jesus shine through them. That lives be changed, hearts be impacted. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Hey, tonight at 5 o'clock, even if you don't serve, you're not on the dream team, come hang out with us. Uh, you may learn something. 5 o'clock tonight, man, I want to see everybody here. Love you guys. See you then. Bye.